27th of February 1991. This is Janice Unwin on behalf of the Oral History Project for Kirkmaiden Information Centre interviewing the Reverend John and Mrs Jean Andrews, formerly of Kirkmaiden Parish, now living in retirement in Sandhead. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Would you care to tell me the date and the circumstances which brought you to Kirkmaiden? Well, yes. Uh, first of all, may I point out that this is Tuesday the 26th of February, as far as our calendar oh. goes. <laughs> Beg your pardon. <laughs> Never mind. I'm, I'm sure it won't make any difference <laughs> to posterity. I, I, I finished my course at uh, college training for the ministry in 1941. And, uh, the war had already started and we had been two years uh, finishing our course because divinity students were given that uh, dispensation that if they were established in their course for the ministry then they weren't called up and they were allowed to complete the course and then decide what they would do. So after 1941, I had a, a year in uh, an assistantship as a continuation of the training, <coughs> and then I did a spell in the church huts. That was the service for the huts and canteens for Her Majesty's course, His Majesty's forces in those days. And the huts work took in a whole lot of the, my contemporaries, the men who finished and uh, who did not uh, want to go into parishes straight away and at the same time didn't fancy being chaplains. So some did go into the chaplaincy, but uh, many of us served in the Church of Scotland huts and canteens for the forces, both at home and abroad. My term was only in a little island in the fifth or fourth called Inchkeith, which was a fortified island at the time, and uh, I was there for a whole year. And it was <coughs> while I was there that I saw the intimation in the, a regular publication at that time, which was the British Weekly. I don't know whether it still goes on, but it was a great place for finding adverts for churches. And this vacancy was for Kit Maiden, Mull of Galloway, or some name like that. I don't know how it was described, but it was Kit Maiden and the address of the person to write to was Dramour. That was my first acquaintance with them, but Jean had been brought up in Galloway uh, as a child, away over near Castle Douglas, and uh, I thought that this would be perhaps a possible place to, to have a look at, and especially since on my wee map it showed that it was very near the sea. I didn't realize that it was surrounded by the sea just as much as any island, but you couldn't tell all these things from the size of map I was using. But I duly sent off application for that. It was a bit, that would be about uh, November 1942. And uh, I had uh, a little while waiting and then uh, I got uh, an invitation to come and preach. It's interesting to notice that uh, I would probably would be the last minister appointed in this area who preached in a what was known as a preaching leet. That is to say, the the congregation in, in those days it was quite a common way of doing it. They didn't uh, they didn't appoint a sole nominee to come as a, the, the one chosen just to present to the congregation, but the the vacancy committee decided to choose a few, more or less, but because in war time shifting around was not so easy. And uh, the vacancy committee had elected so many, that, and they ended up with six names who were to come and preach in succession right through January of 1943. And I was uh, the one who was, January and February, I I was the one who was finally 
brought it in uh, to the, the um, post. Could you tell me, was the previous minister, had he, um, he moved was on? Gone, or he was gone in October. He had moved to, to Glasgow. Oh. Mr. Reverend Alan Shearer was the minister before me. And he went up to North Kelvin side in Glasgow uh, in about the end of October, I think it was. So the vacancy committee were just getting to work in November, and uh, I think that was when I was at the time. So I remember it. And I was away in the, uh, this rock in Edgekeith and uh, just communicating home with letters. And of course, the Jean and I weren't married at the time, so it was uh, a kind of unilateral decision to mm -hmm. have a go at it. And uh, I knew nothing about it, but as a matter of fact, a lot of friends apparently knew Kermaine and knew Dramore far better than, than I had at that time. You know, and uh, there was all kinds of interest in, in my application and finally in my acceptance as being the, the one chosen for the job. The one compensation about being in a preaching league, most people nowadays don't like it at all. It's uh, frowned upon and the poor scorn and such a kind of trial by preaching only, which is uh, all very well, but at least I have the consolation of knowing that, that the, the congregation had every choice possible. <laughs> they had six to choose from when they chose me. It wasn't just a case of Hobson's choice, take me or leave me. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I feel that that's uh, at least something in my, my favour. Uh, so did you arrive as man and wife? Did you, were you married? No, we no. no. We man. didn't need man and man. Well, Jean was, you were... What, I uh, was still teaching and I had to complete a two years say, for, for the parchment, as they called it in these days. So in fact, uh, we weren't married until June and John came down here and was inducted on the 17th of March of 1943. And we were married in, on the 12th of June, 1943. Well, the banks wasn't really uh, ready for occupation, although they had the winter, uh, but uh, it wasn't. <coughs> <clears throat> a time for getting very much done, and uh, they were inclined to, to, to wait until they had a minister appointed before they made some decisions about what should be done, which uh, in a way delayed things, but it suited us fine, because Jean's two years for her magical document mm. were, uh, were not up until June, and uh, so we, we I came down to get made in and I lived for three months in the Mrs. Co with Mrs. Cochrane at the Ivies, which is still John John Cochrane still living there, you right. know, in the in the moor. And I lodged with Mrs. Cochrane and her daughter Eva and later Rody was also there. She was in the land army. And uh, the men were all away, John was away in service somewhere and uh, I can't remember just what, to, the rest of the family were over in New Zealand, the uh, boys, but we, we were there, I was there for the three months and finally the manse was ready and uh, had a bit of painting done and decoration, not a great deal because the, the Rule of the time was you could only get one room papered if you were uh, mm -hmm. if you were going to get anything done at all. It had to be distempered on the walls and so the walls were mostly all uh, distempered. But uh, I can't remember which room it was. Exactly. And it was yeah, a very big manse, wasn't it? Well, well it's a very big manse. Well, bigger than that, maybe it, well, one we've seen since has mm. been as big as it wasn't all that bad. We considered it <coughs> a very good man. Compact. Of course, there was no electricity in those days, very little in the parish at all. No electricity, no gas, oil lamps and oil stove and so on. When I came down to see the man, so I stayed with Mrs. Scott in, in Shore Street, that's Locke's mother, and they had electricity in the downstairs rooms, but oil lamps in the upstairs rooms, and that was quite common because electricity was dear and it cost a lot to have it put it in. So that uh, we started life in the manse without electricity, and I had come from a town situation. 
and we didn't have electricity until about 1949. But Helen was two, I remember that. So that was how we started. How did you heat the mans? Was it coal fires? Coal fires, coal fires. Coal fires. Coal fires and, uh, and, and the oil that? lamps. Uh, we had no idea. Associate. We had two Aladdin lamps in our sitting room. Uh, and if you knew the heat that comes off two Aladdin lamps as well as a coal mm. fire, we never had a cold room really. Mm. Maybe the rest of the house might be a bit, a bit cold, but uh, our sitting room was always cosy. And we knew that when we got changed over to electricity and no longer had the oil lamps mm. because the, the um, fire always needed a wee bit of augmentation <laughs> to, to compensate for the, for the change over. In the kitchen we had what was called a modern mistress stove, which was one step better than an old range. Yeah, but it had a, a you know a, an open fire and a, an oven at one side, oven at the other, just one no, side. No, no, and it had a hot. Well, they gave us hot water. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we weren't com completely without. They had a back boiler, yes. and, uh, and it was good hot water, very good hot water. I also had a paraffin stove with two burners with a little oven you could sit and talk, which was quite adequate, only if you went out of the room, the paraffin wick was liable to pop up. You could come back into the kitchen and find it full of smoke and, and everything covered with soot. And I could tell you a lot of adventures we had, especially when we had visitors and the things that happened that shouldn't have. <laughs> but um, that was, everybody else was in the same boat. You see, uh, most of the farms didn't have electricity and you just accepted it as that was life as it was then. People say, how on earth did you manage? But as I say, everybody else well, was... Well, you didn't know any, but any No, different. everybody else was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we had, we, we had had experience different, certainly. I had had electricity oh, not so long as Dina, mm -hmm. but uh, nonetheless we had it in our village at home. But uh, it wasn't just so much the, the fact that uh, we were without it, as you said, they, all the farms were working away without it. And when I think now, uh, our experience was moderate compared to the experience of lighting up uh, a buyer of a hundred cows in it and, uh, and having to put out and carry wheat oil lamps round about and, and do a milking. And there was still a fair amount of hand milking being done at that time too right. because milk machines were not by any means universal. Mm -hmm. Some I put them in with someone still hoping for it. How did you manage to get around the parish? Did you have a vehicle of some kind? Oh. <laughs> well, there's a story attached to that too <laughs> because uh, I had a bicycle and my flat feet were uh, quite adequate in those days. But uh, there had always been a, a car, the minister had had a car before me. Uh, and there had, since the time of the union of the two congregations, there had even been a, a, a small driving ground. Well, I say small, it was, I mean, uh, something like £10 a year, but uh, £10 a year was quite a lot on, on to your stipend of 400 That was my stipend when I came to get made in £400 a year. But uh, a, a driving ground that went up uh, later on to £20, uh, it was payable, but not obviously if I didn't have a car. But uh, the late Jimmy Gorman, who used to... Archie's brother. Who you didn't know Jimmy either. Gorman. No, no, not Jimmy. Uh, that, but Jimmy was uh, quite a lad and he was a great supporter of mine. All his, all my time in Kitmaiden and his lifetime, uh, he was uh, my man. And uh, he was very anxious that... I should have a car. And they had bought an old uh, two-seater Austin 10, 1933 or 4 model, for the sake of its wheels. He was going to put these wheels onto the cart that he used for, for carting the rubbish. He was a sanitary man in the village and he carted the, the midden rubbish around, uh, way around the shore and dumped it around it. Uh, to kill this. And uh, when he saw the car, which the, an airman had been using, running up and down to Brook from Dolor, he thought better of it and put it into a shed and sort of uh, said, well, maybe it'll come in for something better. 
So when I came to Gamaida and had no car, he offered it to me, and it was in running order. So I learned to drive on that old Austin two-seater, with the rumble seater with that, in the, a hood that was very far from being waterproof. And uh, we had a bit of fun with that too. Not only did I learn to drive, but Jean learned to drive in it too. We had a, I had three lessons from Archie, his brother. Gorman, Archie, Archie was at that <laughs> time driving his wee bus right round the parish to bring in the children to school. And his route was uh, up uh, past uh, Achnach Road End, you know, from down the Glare up to Achnach Road, in Shanks, Norton Cool and then Barn Corkery. And at Barn Corkery, the last of the children got out and Archie drove empty back from Barn Corkery down to to Dremore. Uh, so I got a driving licence and I went with Archie around these rounds until the children were safely out of the bus. And then I drove the bus from there down to Dremore under Archie's tuition on the whole back road down the Spring Blaze and past the old cat and so on down there. And uh, that was the extent of my, <laughs> my driving lessons. Because you wouldn't have, you didn't have to pass it. No test, test at all, no. no. After, uh, after my driving lessons, then I just took the car out and did what I could. I had to be hauled out of a ditch many a time because uh, I didn't uh, do too well when it came to starting off on a hill and sometimes I backed away and landed into the ditch. <coughs> but uh, when that when uh, when I landed in the ditch, it was my neighbour down the road, old uh, Andrew Irving. That's uh, Peter's uncle Andrew. That would be. And where did he live? He lived at the Smithy. Uh, oh, it's we call the Smithy. It's Kirgi uh, Smithy or Low Kirgi or Mid Kirgi or something like that. We call it now. I don't know. It's in the. On the road at down. the top of the Glen Road. Ah, top of the Glen Road. What are we at now? Belongs to Tom Haney now, Tom and Margaret Haney. Uh -huh. But we we used to get to Andrew. He was called Pop by all that knew him. Uh, he would come and uh, take out his old horse and, and haul me out of the ditch. No, I know the old lunch, car. Yes. <laughs> So we both learned to drive then, and of course, then these were the days when you didn't need a driving mm -hmm. test. Have you told Chinese? Yeah, uh -huh. And uh, mm -hmm. you learned to drive sitting You beside taught me, you. yes, and so neither of us ever passed a driving <laughs> test. <laughs> we don't have to. No, I know, that's no. very true. A lot no. of we never old. had to, or an after the war, and so it was pretty So too long much. as we stayed yeah. out of trouble, we never, we never right. were even threatened with that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've both been driving now for. Nearly 50 years. And then had various other ones after that. Some were borrowed, some were. The first real one bought one was two or three years after that. I I'll think. tell you, the only new car we've had between us, I mean, a joint car, is the one we've got now. Mm -hmm. I had a new one at one time, but uh, otherwise it's all been second hand for now. Yeah. This would enable you to perform your parish duties somewhat more efficiently? Or? Uh, well, you, of course you did, you did not have much in the way of petrol to mm -hmm. start with mm -hmm. because uh, we were all on petrol rationing and uh, uh, you just had to conserve your ration. And we walked a lot. I mean, I walked this. up and down to meetings, guild and, and uh, GA and everything, up and down night or day. We really didn't take the car unless for... Well, you did for visitation further afield in the parish, but up and down to the village we just walked. But we were younger then. You mentioned something interesting there about the GA, the Girls mm -hmm. Association. Oh, yes. Now that's something which I've never encountered in the parish of Kirtmain. No, Can well, you the, tell us a little bit? Well, the Girls Association was uh, um, an association of girls in, in the church. And um, in those days, girls and boys kept pretty well apart. It would be taken nowadays, the police would be taken by something like a youth club. It was for girls, and I've forgotten now what the aim of it was, or I would tell you, but it was supposed to be for young women up to the age of 30, because in those days girls didn't marry quite as young. We met 
once a month, I think, and um, oh, I had demonstrations and things, and uh, met other GAs. There was another one in Stranraer. We, every year we gave a concert at Waverley, which was the poor's house in those days, and uh, and it was quite flourishing. I would say there would be a couple of dozen girls anyhow in those days. But eventually the GA outlived its uh, remit because of people marrying younger, because of joint, joint girls activities. and boys and joint activities and it was replaced by youth clubs. It began as the girls auxiliary well, that's in true. the church and, and it was, uh, before the war it was quite strong and uh, they, when, even when we came here there were several branches of it functioning in the uh, two, district. Two. Well, Were you the leader or just the member? Well, I was made the president and I felt I shouldn't have been because I was a married woman, but I was actually the oldest, I think, at uh, 25, I was the oldest of them. But uh, it, it ran itself, more or less. The Guild Auxiliary was, of course, a, an auxiliary to the mission work of the church. That was what it was dedicated to, to start with. They were working at home to help with the missions. Uh, overseas and uh, it was uh, had, a, it had its own constitution in the church and was a kind of reckoned it should be a feeder for the women's guild in the congregations. But I thought there was more than No, I know NGA. from these concerts there was a St Andrews and ourselves and latterly there was one I think in St Margaret's. There was one other but it was only the three of the years. And what was there for the young men then? Well, the, there had the been there, there had been a young men's guild. There had been a men's guild. It's very interesting that uh, the men's guild was formed in the Church of Scotland way back last century, uh, before the women's guild came into being. And the uh, men's guild was quite a strong movement. And then the women just thought they would like to be organised as well. And the, the same man, Dr. Chartres. Uh, kind of got uh, the women organised uh, somewhat later and to the women's guild. Well, the men's guild continued in a lot of congregations and I was quite interested to find that it had been so strong in Kirkmaiden. If you want information about the men's guild, the person you ask is either Peter or uh, Mormon Simpson because they were great enthusiasts in the men's guild. It had, it had become a young men's guild that some of the young men began to grow old. But the war they kind of killed it off. The young men's guild used to meet uh, along with the GA for certain things. They had a badminton club. They even played badminton in their church hall. You can hardly imagine it because of the pillars, but they played a game of badminton there. It was a very successful. Very game. skillful, I would say. We <laughs> played and there ourselves. And it was, that was in the old days before the hall was arranged the way it is. Uh -huh. and, and then they, they had uh, other equipment. Uh, they used to have a bagatelle table and uh, things like that. But uh, these got rather knocked about when the church hall was used by some group of... Uh, who was it that got blamed for that? <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, the RAF before the before the billets were built. I don't know, but uh, anyway, the the young men's guild never revived after the war. It was all the boys were away. Would that be a general situation in Scotland? Do you think? Because oh, it's faded in a lot of places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Rickerton in Kilmarnock, they had had a young men's guild there. And in just the same way, it had, had stopped meeting during the war. There was so little time for it, even for the ones who were still at home. But uh, whether it ever got back on uh, any footing at all, I don't know. It's a pity. It was a it was a very useful movement. But Can you tell us therefore some of the other uh, parish organisations? Oh, well, there's the youth club which we started, which was flourished well for a number of years. And was, how many would we have in it? Uh, that was mixed. A mixed, mixed that club, was mixed. yes. That was a, uh -huh. uh, just uh, in the last, uh, we started it almost straight away yes. because there was a there was a lady living 
in lodging with the Mrs. Cochran uh, at the same time as I was there, and Dora Hutchison, her uh, husband. She was New Zealand, but her husband, a local fellow from Dromore district, had uh, had died in the in the RAF, and uh, so Dora came with her wee boy to lodge at the Ivies for a spell, and she was a terrific enthusiast, and she got me moving to do something for the young folk and they started this Saturday night club which did all kinds of things. Did yeah. you meet in the hall? Again? In the mm -hmm. church hall, yes. This was long before it was uh, renovated and when the old wooden floor was in knots and nails all over the place mm -hmm. and that uh, we had an awful lot of fun in that place. We did two or three pantomimes. We did concerts and the one act plays, but we had two pantomimes which you and I wrote and uh, are still remembered by some of the people who were in them. In those days the platform was at the other end of the hall, as you know. I understand. Mm -hmm. And there yes. no curtains, nothing, just no... No, we had curtains. And we, we, we did laugh at the And no, you know, no water or anything, no kitchen, no nothing, just two mm -hmm. little kind of side bits on each side of the platform where you could uh, get ready to go on. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the, that 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 was quite good fun, and we spent a lot of time. And then, of course, there was also the scouts and the cubs, which we we restarted the restarted scouts. Restarted at that time. Scouts had been in the parish uh, before the war, but they had uh, got into abeyance, as you might say, and uh, joined the war. Of course, a lot of years. Uh, ago. well, it was <laughs> even two years before that. Uh, <laughs> They, they actually started a group of the ATC oh in yes, the parish before the before war broke out. Uh, and the, that's the Air Training Corps. Yeah. It was associated with oh, the Frook, the with the uh, Royal Air Force of the Frook. And uh, Mr. Black, the schoolmaster at that time, was the, was the officer in command. And he had, uh, he had been, I think he had been the scout leader at the, at the earlier time for a, a bit, but uh, the ATC was had a kind of urgency about it just in 1938 and so on, and uh, these boys were partly trained before the war broke out, in fact, uh, in the kind of Air, Air Force Jane. But, uh, you know, in these years, if there was a parade of any sort in the village, which there was from time to time, mm -hmm. you'd have been amazed at the size of it because there would be the ATC and there would be the Home Guard and there would be probably, I don't know about some of the Cubs some, and some of the, and the life, uh, yes, and the, the life, the, um, the people who were on the, the life, well, no, I don't mean the life, the Coast rescue, Guard. rescue, Coast Guard, Coast yeah, Guard. The Coast Guard, mm -hmm. yes, you know, but there was a rescue team, there was still, uh, isn't there? Yes. The rocket team. And, yes. then, and then the chaps who were in the RAF and the billets as well, you had quite a parade going sure. on. And they, I mean, the Home Guard would be, you know, And what occasions would these oh, parades take? Uh, you know, like St Andrew's <laughs> Day? Or? I think there were things yeah, like Wings exactly. for Victory and that. Do you remember how, no, you don't, of course, but during the war there were, um, <laughs> there were all sorts of fun, fun fundraising, fundraising affairs, things. Uh, yes. Uh, but I, mean, I can just see them parading up the street. And uh, uh, special uh, celebrations, as we eat. And they would have flags and standards? Well, in Not those much. days, no, 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 what flags were used for in those days was when there was a wedding in the village or in the roundabout, everybody put flags out the windows. Union Jack, Union Jack, or, Jacks, or, or the gate post or, or something. the gate post, and if there was a wedding in the village, you know, out Well, you put it up at the house where the bride was. Well, but other people put them out as well. Yeah, well I know when we came home family. from our honeymoon, we. In those days, you, you got a taxi, you got Alec Peebles' taxi out from the town, and we got to the foot of the drive, and there were two big flags stuck in the gate posts at the foot of the drive. And when we got up to the house, the whole of the board and session and whatnot were busy waiting for us, but unfortunately, our flitting, our things had arrived at the same time. So, what we saw was people busy handing things out of a railway van when they were waiting to welcome us. There was the second, the second part of second our, part of our, our flitting. Flitting. First had just part arrived at the long The time. main bits of the furniture was already installed, but this was uh, including our wedding presents mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, which were being quickly ferried in mm -hmm. by and the elders, the elders and board members, but the rest 
very quickly it was all tidied up and we had a great we party up there at the manse so that was to welcome we us um, home. For a long time these flags were out in the village when there was a Oh village. yes, and, yes. and uh, now when was the last one I saw? Not so very many years ago. I think it was a garth on when Oh, uh, that's right. Um, they had a flag at Huckabreck when um, Linda Mac was married. Uh, they they? Would, yeah, they would. They would. Yeah, they would. I remember now. Uh -huh. Gillian uh -huh. Willow would, yes. would surely have flags uh -huh. out. Well, that well, that's where the thing comes when we put the flags out. Put I the flags out. I don't know why it was a custom in Camden. I never knew anywhere else, but it definitely was. Yes, and some of the flags were faded, I can mm -hmm. tell you. They had been in use had for many years. Had them since the coronation, <laughs> which was 1937. Uh -huh. yeah. But uh, it, was, it was quite a nice touch. There also was the Women's Guild, of course, that was another organisation. In those days it met once a month in the afternoon. And I went to it, I was very young, and I thought they were all such old, old... Guild, Mrs. Yes. Well, um, the Guild was a small meeting and it met once, as I said already, once a month in the afternoon and it really was in those days mostly knitting for the, the forces as so many women's organisations were doing. Much later on when we had a big celebration in 1981 I read up the old minutes which went away back before that and that was when I found when they had decided to do this kind of thing. Um, the Guild, of course, had been going on for a long time before 1931, but in 1931 the two churches in, in Kirk Maiden were united, so I decided off my own bat that 50 years from 1931 when they came together, 1981 was a great occasion for celebrating and we had a big celebration then for the 50 years. By that time, of course, the Guild was vastly different because uh, from the meeting in the afternoon we changed to an evening meeting and then we eventually changed to doing it once a fortnight instead of once a month, which it has remained to this yes, day. It has, yes. And uh, the Guild, of course, has um, covers a wide field, uh, gathering information about the work of the church and passing it out and um, hearing about people speaking about things, doing things. And and you know yourself. Yes, and still a strong guild in Kermaine. I think it's quite strong, yeah. Strong. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the whole of the guild is fairly strong everywhere because women's meetings tend to stay strong, uh, more so maybe than young people's things and men's things. Yes, the women are more settled uh -huh. in their environment. And it's a very good channel of information to the ordinary folks. Uh -huh. And you were, now we mustn't forget to say you were president of that I same guild. I was president for oh, heavens, something years? like him. Um, uh, not quite 40 years. years. 30 it might have been. I wasn't president at first when I went because somebody else was president then during in the 1943. During the vacancy yes. they had uh, one of their members. Uh -huh. was it, was because in those days president. it was really the minister's wife who was president. That was a tradition. Field. That was the tradition and I think it was a good tradition too. And uh, anyhow I was about um, I, was, uh, I must have been about three years later that I became president, say 1946, I think it would be, and uh, remained so until 1982. And did you have a lot of contact with the other guilds in the area? Oh yes, quite a lot, because um, the, there's, uh, there were joint meetings during the war and when petrol was scarce we didn't see so much of each other at once things they uh, began to improve and transport was easier with a lot of joint meetings and uh, the guild is a very sort of um, friendly kind of place everybody knows each other so there's still That's quite true. a lot of contact yes and did you have the ever have the privilege of going to the edinburgh meetings at that time was that um yes from time to time i did of course the events i got bogged down with the, the young family and it wasn't so easy getting away but and then i was teaching it wasn't easy but i have been at meetings in edinburgh for the, the, the annual meetings uh, from time to time these originally used to meet during the assembly when the ministers were in edinburgh and their wives came to the what we call the mass meeting in those days then that now was in the held in the usher hall uh, at that time, yes, they were held in the Usher Hall, and then later on they were kind of divorced from the Assembly and they met in the Assembly Hall. And uh, So the Men's Assembly met in the Usher Hall, Richard? No, 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 no. The I met in the Assembly Hall. And right. Around, 
But the women's meetings went on at the same time. So they had to be somewhere else. Do so they use the, use the Asher, Asher Hall. Hall? Also the Butte, the, 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 what do you call the hall in, in the university, is not the Butte Hall. McEwen Hall. McEwen Hall, I was been there too. But it was chiefly the Asher Hall. There were four, four big meetings, rallies, uh, in, in the Asher Hall in the first week of the assembly. There was uh, the main rally, and there was uh, the overseas, the women's overseas, or women's foreign mission, as mm -hmm. it was called, and there was a uh, um, home mission day. And I can't you mind what the. Well, it's uh, called social and moral welfare now. now uh, what it was the women's temperance or something that, like that. No, no, that was a different thing. The women's temperance association. Mm -hmm. The Asher Hall wasn't popular because. The gallery, the top gallery, is so steep, and for a lot of women that was quite frightening, which was, I think, why they tried the McEwen Hall too. But these meetings are still going on, still very well yeah. attended. The, the GA and the Guild went on uh, together in the parish mm -hmm. for uh, a few years after the war. Mm -hmm. the, but I can't remember when the GA got smaller uh, because the population got gradually smaller as it has done mm -hmm. and there weren't so many available and somehow or other it kind of faded out. Yes, can you tell me when the guides and brownies started then? Did they take over from that one? Oh, no, 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 that's no. It's a different kind of thing altogether. Um, you know... The guides were, uh, uh, were uh, functioning were as far as uh, uh, and or mm -hmm. uh, when we were when we came, well, uh, I can't remember. And the rangers. Oh, there were rangers. Yes, that's right. The ranger guys were were uh, under Miss McLean. I can't remember who. Oh, now the person you need to get in touch with is Jessie McLean from Bulgaria. Oh, yeah. oh yes, yes, that's true. She's uh, she's the authority there. Mm -hmm. I will make you. I think Jessie came quite soon after. Uh, we arrived and was running the guides mm -hmm. for a, She certainly ran them later on for a, for a few years. Yes. Miss Iona McLean, who was the teacher in uh, in Dravore School, uh, she was the person who was in charge of the ranger guides for a long number of years, and she worked very hard with them. Brownies had started, uh, I think, before the war. Mrs. Uh, Honey. Uh, Miss College, but, uh, that's uh, Robert College's sister, was uh, responsible for starting the guides. Maybe, uh, maybe it's the guides I'm thinking about, not the brownies. Before the war, I can remember that uh, it was Miss College who applied for permission to use the church hall for, for guiding, and uh, she later married the minister, Mr. Honey, and departed. That was the way back. In 1933, and then she got married. Who took them over after that? Yeah. I'm not sure. But there were there certainly were guides before 1933. I came into the Brownies comparatively late. It was about 1972 or three that I took the Brownies over, and uh, I mean Cubs was my thing, and I, uh, Cubs at the beginning. So I really don't know very much, and there's not much. <coughs> Not much history lying about uh -huh. to tell us. We were talking about the scouts uh, a while back. The scouts had been functioning uh, before, uh, in the way back 1920s and the 1930s. And uh, when I came to the parish, I had always been associated with scouting. In fact, Jean and I met through mm -hmm. a club concert. But uh, we put scouting back on the agenda again by I started scouts and she started cubs and uh, she functioned only until she started producing her own oh, cub yeah. oh, and then uh, the after that the, the cubs uh, had to go out of the meeting that day uh, I kept the scouts going for a wee while but it was difficult because there didn't seem to be anybody coming along who could uh, take charge when I wasn't able to be there, mm -hmm. and when I wasn't there, uh, there's all kinds of awkward situations, so and then I thought maybe if I gave it up, uh, somebody else might mm -hmm. step forward. It was many years before I really had to start them up again myself. Uh, 
these scouts were actually first route in Shire, weren't they? No, no, not they first. Not, no. Oh, I thought they were. They were one of the early numbers, yeah. obviously, had been started. Yeah. They're third, aren't they? And they're third just now, but I really think they ought to have been second. They were, they were quite early, but uh, in the old records, I think they were uh, featured as a second Wigtonshire. But mm. it was a third Wigtonshire that I was told when I started them up mm. uh, to begin with, and it was third Wigtonshire we restarted. As a, in what year would that be? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. We need to find out <laughs> in the years not probably. Too, not too important. No. The, um, obviously, there were quite a few young people and young children in the parish, so you must oh, have done yes. quite a lot of baptisms, marriages. Oh, yes. Uh, baptism, marriages, and were they baptism. usually performed in the church, or did you? No, no, no. no. Most baptisms were in the home until. Uh, after I'd been here about seven years, I had been pushing to get baptism into the church. Is this a Scottish custom up to have a baptism in the home? Yeah, I should imagine it probably was, yes. It wasn't, a, it wasn't even a, a Scottish Reformation idea because the Reformation folks were very strongly against what they called hidden baptisms as practiced by the Roman Church and uh, John Knox and company were all very keen that baptism should be in the face of the congregation but somehow or other in Scotland there had grown up this kind of tradition that you just got the child christened at home and uh, if you uh, suggested taking them to church you were putting on a bit of side, you were mm -hmm. It's the same with marriages, of course. Uh, you were sure enough. I was years, two or three years in the parish before I had uh, the first marriage in church of a, of so a local person. So they were normally person. at home as well? Or, or no, the hall, they could or be or in a hall or where the reception was or, yeah. or at the manse and then the reception sure. afterwards. Sorry, is that all? Oh, it's the table. Some were in the home, I can remember some nice weddings in the in the bride's own home and uh, what do you Maybe and, uh, Betty, I'm sorry, but the the marriage in church idea was oh, you, you really were you weren't entitled to do that unless you were having a very big slap up wedding and and uh, expensive uh, things mm -hmm. So fact, I can remember the first wedding uh, that I did have in church was a uh, Coast Guard's daughter uh, from, the, from the Coast Guard station who was English and she was uh, she was quite happy to come to church just with her own wee handful of guests uh, and be married in church because she never would have dreamed of being married anywhere else you see but it was it was quite a novelty in a sense in the parish that uh, she was married in church but she was just in her uniform I forget what she, service if she was in and uh, the and there was only the wedding party and uh, and uh, a few close relatives mm -hmm. and nobody else in church at the time and the, the local people I don't know some of them would probably think they were going for ways to the church <laughs> But then, later on, church weddings became much more common and, uh, and desirable, so that we had the opposite situation of folks coming to church to get married who had never been in church much before, as you always do find. And uh, a nice thing about the weddings in Kameen for many years was that the village folk might stand outside uh, up to a certain point, but they would come in and fill the gallery, especially yeah. in the church. And still do. Before, yeah. before the wedding really started, and they were there, and up the size of the church too, in addition to the guests. And nowadays, I'm afraid, latterly anyway, when I was finding there's far too many of them just hanging around outside, because uh, that had never been much of a thing. Well, for children, maybe even children came into the weddings in the early years. But they they were uh, they were more involved in it. As I, I thought as being worshippers rather than 
just standing outside gawking as a spectator. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also sometimes uh, you could hear them on a summer's day when they had left the door of the church open and you could hear the buzz of talk and laughing and so on going on all through the service. But I, I, I think that uh, it, it was it was quite a, an interesting thing how much, uh, how little the, the, the church was assumed to be the only place at that time for these services. Mm. Funerals is another case in point. When uh, my first funerals for the years, uh, it was uh, in the home. The, the first service was in the home. Having a, a service in church was something that was reserved for, well, sometimes for an elder, uh, and uh, even then it would be some, maybe some who had been a long time an elder and something like that, and they uh, make it a, a special service for the whole the congregation or a minister certainly but uh, that wasn't here uh, but as far as the, the rest of folks were concerned you took the funeral at the door of the church of the house uh, I used to stand at the, the main door the front door and the, con the Worshippers would be the, the dear friends and relatives of the inside that was cramming into the rooms. Must have been very restricting in some houses. Uh, really but outside you would have the whole crowd of them. Yeah, rain and, or shine. And the rain or shine, the standing there the out in the, in the rain. And, and, uh, and I conducted the service just from, say, the porch or the with the front door or something where I could be heard both inside and outside. And then would the majority go on to the committal? At the oh, uh, uh, what was it you used to see on a bad day? Or used to see there's many more funerals because of the weather? When oh, the well, that was, that was at the committal service yes, because uh -huh. it was an exposed kit beard and it was, mm -hmm. it was really very wild at times up in Kit Maiden. You almost felt that some of the folks who were there would never survive it. But they all had their bowler hats. No women, of course, went to the churchyard in those days. No women. Uh, uh, no women would have gone really to the. Uh, only a few friend women would go to the home. There was all the men. Mm -hmm. And when it came to start of church funerals, too, mm -hmm. in the early years, it was all the men. But church yeah, funerals, as they are too. today, we, we never had anything like that at all. And as I say, all the men wore their bowler hats. And but some of them had these old square bowler hats, remember? They only got out for those that for funerals. Oh, there were uh, about 40 shades of green, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you wore your top hat in those days oh, to a funeral. Yes, oh, yes, I wore my top hat for years, too, mm -hmm. and uh, my dress coat, front coat, and uh, and so on. And uh, the first funeral that I had in Kitmaiden was from Dromoor. And we walked from Dromoor behind the hearse all the way up to the Kitmaiden. But that was really, that had been the custom. Would that be a motor driven hearse? A motor driven hearse at that time, yes. Earlier on, of course, it was a horse driven, a horse drawn hearse, mm -hmm. and that was perfectly acceptable and seemly, but it was the motor-driven hearse that killed off the old custom of walking all the way up to the county yeah. yeah. because uh, during the war they made the excuse that they, they hadn't got the, oh, sorry, the they hadn't got the um, petrol to, to go up so slowly to accompany men walking so they stopped the practice and they started to Harvest time would have been a busy period for the whole community, Mr. Andrews. How did you fill in your time at that? Well, in the parish of Kermaden, you could never be very far away from harvest and knowing what all about it, because in those days everybody was at it at the same, more or less at the same time. There was a tremendous urgency and at the same time a, a tremendous fellowship in the harvest and uh, I myself from the very first harvest in Kid Maiden when I couldn't keep myself from going down to the harvest field 
right beside the manse and asking if there was anything I could do to help. I got involved in harvests in various farms uh, for as long as they they could use the service of a, of an extra hand. That's to say, as long as it wasn't over mechanised as it is today, we had uh, we had great harvest enjoyment in the various processes of stooking and and carting in and building the stacks in the stackyard and all the wonderful skill that went into every process and I I think I enjoyed these harvest days as much as any days in the whole parish work although it wasn't strictly speaking my own work but it helped me to get much closer to the folks who were responsible for doing it when I was uh, able to use my own two hands and, and labour. One time though I had a wedding arranged at the manse where many weddings took place and I had uh, gone away to do my stint at it was really a pally home that particular occasion and I was busy forking off a cart in the stackyard at Halley home when there arrived uh, Alec Peebles in his taxi and he had already taken up to the man's a young couple who were waiting for me there. Yeah. I, I was having, waiting for him. I, I was quite certain that it was to be eight o'clock or something o'clock and it was actually seven. seven or something. <laughs> and they were there an hour sooner than I had expected them and so I I had heard of it he would rush up to the man's and change into more appropriate clothing for the job that was in hand that time. And there was another time when you suddenly arrived up in the car, dashed out, shouted at me, I forgot I had a funeral, <laughs> and <laughs> rushed to change for that, so occasionally... Well, <laughs> that, uh, I'm glad to say, was as near as I came in the whole of my ministry to yes, forgetting a yes, funeral. Uh-huh. I never, I never Fortunately, the corpse out. waited. In fact, I, I never missed Most out on anything. <laughs> Uh, weddings or anything else uh, all the time that mm-hmm. I had them. And you made that funeral in time. Mm-hmm. And you made the wedding too, a bit breathless. Oh, I made the mm-hmm. wedding, but there was, uh, but it was, was there. past the time when I should have been there. Mm-hmm. To, <laughs> It'll be a topic of see. conversation now. Yes, I want no doubt. No doubt. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also know that you were both involved with the um, annual nativity play for some years. Oh, for oh, many right. years, many years. The nativity play was done by the Sunday school and it started because um, we couldn't find a, a good nativity play suitable for the numbers and the kind of people we had. There were always for far too many. So no, there weren't. Was, uh, uh, far too few parts. Far too few parts uh, and great the, mobs of the, people well, apart from the, No, the, 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 any plays that were in production mm-hmm. were... Uh, we found that uh, they had very few parts for women, for example. That's right. Mm-hmm. You could uh, always rely on the getting two or three shepherds and mm-hmm. two or three, and three wise men and uh, and things like that. But uh, there was Apart no the real angel. provision for women except for putting them into the angel chorus. So, so John we, decided to write his own, which he did. And I uh, pity we can't remember what year. It was, but Betty Beck was quite definitely Mary at one time. It started off in a, in, in, in with a, some scenes just uh, in the kind of normal way uh, with Angel Chorus and now the rest of it. And then a couple of years of that and then I wrote a, a scene that brought in women at the well, which was uh, a kind of introduction to the scene in Bethlehem and uh, gave me a chance to incorporate three or four parts for for women, uh, which was based on the Bible, but not, uh, you know, not an episode at the Christmas story, really, but it fitted in 
And, uh, then one year we had a lot of good little singers, so we decided to, uh, or John, I wasn't really taking so much to do with it until then, John decided to introduce the Angel Chorus, which again became a tradition, and we had that always after the Choir of Angels. We were always lucky with good singers. But the other introduction we, was the, the introduction of the children's scene. Oh yes, I forgot and, uh, about the children. I, I wrote a, a scene for six wee ones. Uh, and, uh, at that time, the, the wee ones were seven and eight year old. Yes, mind, and the big like ones today, were when they're fourteen and fifteen. I yeah. was t- we were talking about, uh, we've got photographs of this. Uh, we've, we've got big fellas and they're fourteen, as he says, and... Uh, mm-hmm. Tall and the great shepherds, some of them, they always had to get made up with beards. Mm-hmm. We, we spent quite a bit of time getting them made up for the parts uh, with beards as shepherds and, and wise men. And and you and the angels, uh, the angels chorus, uh, we, we used a, a thing I saw in the performance of Hansel and Gretel, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. Uh, Instead of dressing them all in white, which looks off a kind of bleak, mm-hmm. unless you've got awfully good lighting, I dressed them in scarlet and mm-hmm. blue. We had and white until then. And uh, the, the angel dresses, which were just sheets down the side, you know. And that must have been about 30 years ago because oh, yeah. Johnny was so oh, small yeah. that he was scared that Hansel and Gretel, that's why I'm remembering that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it went on, and success, and we always did the same play. There's an awful lot of people in Kirk Maiden. Now, if you started on the lines, they would, our own family could recite the whole thing yet. And, uh, I mean, as I say, people like Betty were the big, were Mary at one time. There was the Mary and the big angel. And then one year, we happened to have identical twins in the Sunday school. And so we introduced two other angels, which again became a tradition. And we had one three of the, sets one of... One of these identical twins is living up here yes. in mm-hmm. We had three Elizabeth. sets of identical twins over the years oh. mm-hmm. um, who did those parts. And it went on until John wasn't quite so fit, because it really was an awful lot of work. It really was at the last... And he wasn't feeling quite so fit, so laterally it was scaled down to more of just a, a Christmas pageant with not so much well, learning and production. Not so much and so that I wasn't so fit, really. No, I think I it, was it was because the, the, the numbers mm-hmm, were de- declining, and of course the age of the the cattle younger. was yeah. getting, was getting so uh-huh. young that I couldn't really produce mm-hmm. the people who had the caliber for, for doing it mm-hmm. the, the way I used to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, a uh, great help. Miss M- Miss McLean, the teacher, was a great help for years. She did a lot of the dressing, mm-hmm. especially the, the women folk. And she was Makeup very good mm-hmm. with yeah. with the uh, dressing. And and the music was that your yes, yeah, 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 yeah. uh-huh. I picked yeah. out the well, the the angel choir came on every now and then and sang a wee song of some sort or of another, and it was quite pleasant. It's quite pleasant. Music obviously is is what it's you my thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you shine at. So mm-hmm. I mean, you you did go back to teaching music after yeah. your family were born. Well, it was in or 1950. During. Yes, in 1950, I started teaching in the secondary school because they were looking for a teacher. Not because you know in those days ministers' wives didn't really have jobs, but they were looking for a teacher so that they, an extra teacher so that they could start SCE music the the, the teacher at that time and uh, so I started there first just um, two afternoons a week and it gradually snowballed and I taught in the secondary school until 1975 and uh, then I went into primary schools taught around the county till about 1982 when I retired that That was was the various primary schools yes yes, I had seven latterly I had seven primary schools rushed in and out of them for Mm -hmm. two or three hours and uh, then retired. And Dromore was one of them. Dromore, I was yes, Dromore was one. I was there all the time. Some of the the other primary schools changed around, but I was in Dromore all the time, which was very useful when I had the brownies in the Sunday it's school because right, I could always was yeah I could always see why were you not there last Sunday or last Monday or whatever, and I found it was very useful contact, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed it. It was a nice school to teach in too. So um, I'm still doing quite a lot of music, of course, but not in schools. And some of our local musical artists 
-hmm. must have come through your hands. Yes, well, yeah, I'd have them in secondary school, quite a number of the people who are performing now and doing things and playing organs and so on I had. But, of course, what I taught in school was just general music appreciation and singing. I wasn't a private teacher. I could have been, I could have had any number of pupils, but I wasn't a private teacher. It was just what they absorbed. I had a choir in the school, actually, which I called the Tuesday Singers, which was girls from fifth and sixth year. And a lot of them have gone on and are in choirs and so on elsewhere That's and have nice. kept up their interest. Mm -hmm. It's quite rewarding. So some of our local talent, such as uh, Betty, oh, Well, Betty, mentioned. who's now the organist, mm -hmm. had her at school. But in justice to uh, that side of the Oh, thing, yes, we should mention Miss Agnew. Well, uh, uh -huh. the teacher who taught Mr John McGuffin mm -hmm. and made him the pianist and and organist for so many years, and who also taught Andy. Andrew McGuffey, mm -hmm. and, and he made his start, mm -hmm. and countless others in the parish for years. She maybe taught Betty for all I know. I mean, I she, didn't teach anything. She was a piano. teacher in this school, Miss in, Agnew. In school. In yes. school, the central school, Miss Agnew. We call her Miss Agnew, and the local folk call her Miss Agnew. And uh, she was a great infant teacher for many years and she also taught piano. When you say the central school? That's, that's, just, that's the old the, name for it. The one that's up on the hill? The one that's up. Oh, well, it used to be Dromore School, that's mm -hmm. the central school. You see, uh, when the school board mm -hmm. set up uh, and uh, the church schools were eliminated, Kilmaiden had two schools uh, associated with the churches, so one down what is now the Shepherd's Hall was a school. Now tell me the Shepherd's Hall, where's it? The Masonic Hall. The Masonic People Hall. The Central School. Uh, right. uh -huh. Are you okay? Right. Yes. Um, the this, is, this is all history, you see. It's, it's, a, it's a very most interesting chapter of the history of the parish. But I've really got to go back a bit. And, uh, in 1843, there was a big disruption, a split in the Church of Scotland, and the Free Church of Scotland was formed. Now, the parish church at that time was up at the hill, up at the top of the hill where it still is, you know, the old church, kept coming. And the parish school was up there as well. That's the wee building that uh, has no roof on it, that sits in a corner of the churchyard, very small single room apartment. Well, that was the school, the parish school. And uh, it had been there for about a hundred years or more, even in 1843, I think. Well, when the disruption came, the Free Kirk was formed and they decided to build their church down in Dromore. And they got permission from the Earl of Stair, although he was the patron of the parish church, he gave a grant of land down in the Moor village where our uh, present church hall is. That was the, the original disruption church. And as well as building the, the church hall, they decided that they were going to take their children out of the parish school and have their own school. So they set up the Free Kirk School and they built the other little hall down the, the lane from the church and that was uh, the school building and they had a little house there which I suppose would originally be the schoolmaster's house, it's only a two room affair but that would probably be as much as the man would expect in those days and they appointed their own uh, schoolmaster and uh, an assistant as well latterly and they taught school there for uh, from 1843 until uh, 1872. And in 1872 there was passed the uh, Act setting up school boards in Scotland and these school boards took over the responsibility for uh, charging rates for education and uh, they were able to build a school in every parish eventually which became the 
the United School for the Parish. It was no longer associated with the church one way or other. And then in Gatmaiden, the, the school that was built was the one up in the hill from the village. And at the same time, schools were built in the south end of the parish, called the Heath end of the parish, a uh, small school. It's and still the, referred to as a And the Lake, the Lake end of the parish, and that was Portloga oh, School. Okay. Well, Portloga School usually got to uh, Portlogan, or uh, aye, Portlogan School. But the one at the lake end of the parish, at the heath end of the parish, was called the Malt School eventually, or the Southern School for the old folk. And the one in the middle yes. was the Central School. And the old, the old people still who talked about it, they went to the Central School. And uh, well, down in the village, the, the, the hall that had been, the, what had been the school for so many years for the free kept folks, just attached almost to their own church, now became redundant, so they made it a church hall, and that was the original church hall down the lane. And uh, then in 1900, they decided to build the lovely new church, St. Medan's Church. The Free Cap Congregation by this time was known as the United Free Church because there had been a a union of two free kept to make the United Free Kept, and they and they were on a great drive to build new churches because the ones that had been put up at the time of the disruption had been put up on on a shoestring, you know, no funds or anything at all at that stage, and they built them on the cheap. But now they had become quite a, a wealthy section of the church in Scotland and they were able to consider a building program for replacement of these. And one of the places where that program took place was in Kirkmaiden. The church in Dromore by Cookers was named, known as the Kirkmaiden Free Church and then it was the one that was built at Maidens at first was called the Kirkmaiden United Free Church. It was always the name Kirkmaiden that was used. It never was Dromore Church or any of that. It was, they hung on to the name just the same as the parish church. And uh, they had the, that wee church was built, the St. Mead's Church was built for £6,000 or something like that, which was a lot of money in 1900. It was finally opened in 1903. And that meant that uh, well, the folk, folk like Moreland, for example, who had been in the church, he, he, he worshipped in the church hall as a church. That was the church he, he knew first. And now they went across the road to their lovely new church. So the church uh, across the way was redundant, but now they made that into the church hall. And... Uh, the little bit, bit down the road, down the lane that would have been the church hall was now redundant, so they sold it, and it was it was uh, transferred to then to the ancient order of shepherds. Before, uh, after many years, it became it was the shepherds hall when we knew it at first. Mm -hmm. We used to have wee dances down there, and, and uh, a wedding reception I remember down there very much, mm -hmm. and things like that. Oh, it also, it was used, used it for tea then. sometimes when there was something going on in the church, church hall. Church hall, an overflow. But uh, it was the ancient order of shepherds. They, they stopped meeting, but they still had a kind of constitution <laughs> and funds for a while. And then they sold it to the nation. I don't remember. You remember what year that was? No, I do no, not. I don't no. remember. Mm -hmm. I remember when it happened. So the ancient order of shepherds, does that still exist in other parts? I don't think so. I no. don't hear no. anything, any mention of it now. No. They used, to, they used to have their, wee, their parades and they wore uh, bonnets, kind of on grey bonnets mm. and uh, plates with the black and white. Uh, I'm sure I've seen pictures now, mm. you can't uh, mention uh, it. Uh, over their shoulders. Yes. John, John McGuffock again has one of these plates mm. still. I hope he has yeah. still anyway. He used to have it. Uh, I've seen it many times. But, uh, and what was the object of their organisation? It was... Uh, uh, a mutual uh, help, as I say, 
they, 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 they met regularly and had speakers and so on. They were, they were about, they were temperance societies, you know, they, they were against drinking and they, they were um, trying to kind of uh, improve the, the working people's lot in life and they, when they were, before, before there was any great relief of uh, unemployment or poverty or that, they had this mutual help society. They paid so much into their funds and when, when they were unwell or like a out of a job, probably. they like had a, a fund to administer, they gave a grant to somebody. Mm -hmm. so, so. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other one that's, uh, that went on even longer than the shepherds. Well, so many things that like the Masons is rather like it, mm -hmm. except that Eastern they are Star much more of a cult. Uh, but there was the order of Easter Star, like that, and that was a woman. No, I think it was. Mm -hmm. yes. The shepherd was all made. You see. Mm -hmm. And there is um, still a welfare fund, isn't there, in Kitmaiden? I wonder if that's where it. No, it doesn't come from that. No, the, 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 no, the, the welfare, welfare fund originated from various funds. I mean, you mean these residue funds might, might have, have gone, gone into, into it, yes. yes. But uh, there's a whole lot of things. Uh, the Marshall bequest, yes, I was the. Um, about that. the Ferguson, um, what's that? That's something else. No, that's an independent thing. Yes, but, uh, huh? No, the marshal and and different. I mean, there was something you had to help administer at mm -hmm. Christmas yeah. every year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 we do. I know the welfare committee still do uh, give out money to, shall we say, the needy yes, in the yes, parish. Yes. I mean, the so welfare exists. committee is an official government thing. With no, those welfare committees no, no. Was no. in those days it was it, it was a uh, it was just a, a kind of administering mm -hmm. the the parish council. Yes. They were responsible for administering the these funds mm -hmm. on behalf of the poor in the parish. And the, men, the church also had its share of funds, bequests and money mm -hmm. left yeah. by people. It was a great thing for a long time that uh, if they were putting up a headstone for a family that had uh, sort of died out or wasn't likely to find there was no survivors about the to, parish, to take care of they would uh, leave money to the church first of mm -hmm. all to, for the, the purposes of the church itself and then they would leave money in the care of the church for the maintenance of the headstone yeah. and the upkeep of the grave. We used to call it the grave's money and there were several families uh, represented in the funds that had been left under that heading including the Marshall graves even to this day. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's the two or three incidents there. I mean, there are quite a few yes, headstones right. that are still uh, under the care of the cat mm -hmm. right. And they're supposed to be keeping them painted and cleaned up when they need it and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Just one, one thing that surprises me from what you've told me, the size of the little original school up in the old churchyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there must have been an awful lot of children. Ah, but they then they didn't all go to school. School no, wasn't right. compulsory. Oh, that, 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 that would be the difference. That, that was a extended. Mm -hmm. the, if you go back into the history of, of the great William Todd's history of the parish of Maiden, uh, and he is the, is the sort of authority for the early part of the 19th century, he was the headmaster, he was the schoolmaster, he wasn't just a headmaster, he was the, he was the school uh, from about the 17. Ninety something. Uh, I was, no, before the Reformation, before the French Revolution, he, he started up a thing. But anyway, when it came to 1843, he was the, the headmaster, the schoolmaster in the parish church school. But he was also the leader of the body that wanted to break away from the parish church and make the free church, and uh, he took his minister with him, more or less. So the the authorities immediately said, well, you can't be schoolmaster anymore, you'll just have to give up your post. And they fought them and you wrote letters to the free press and they did all kinds of things to try and resist this, which he thought was unjust. unjust. And anyway, that great William Todd, he was, a, he was quite a character, and he relates in his book how at one time he 
they had to fight the inheritors, the landowners and the people in the parish who were responsible for the things to get the school extended because the school, he always talked about the schoolroom. Well, you can see the extension to this day in the wall. You just look at it and you'll see where they added on about six feet onto the <laughs> extent of the wall and uh, presumably re-roofed it. It would be thatched roofed. And, yeah. and it, uh, it would just be earth floor and it would have uh, benches for the children to sit on if they were lucky. And, <laughs> and he taught there something like a hundred children at that time. Mm -hmm. Incredible to think that, isn't it? I and think then, there's now 33 at Drawall School. No. Yes, well, when we came, there were three schools and none of them was anything as well, small Paul as Paul Logan had 33 and I knew more than 33. Mull had, yeah. two. Mull, Mull had two teachers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I used to think Paul Logan had two, but I oh, think... Oh, Paul Logan had two teachers. At, yes, at well, I, see, I think it had three when we came. Yeah, and Dramore had four. Yes, mm -hmm. when my son started, there were four. Yes, yes. of course, when I had finished I teaching, when I retired in 1982, there were still four teachers at Dramore. It's just... Yes. It's gone down quickly. Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, at one time I had 29 brownies and then nowadays there's only a handful. What, what can you expect? Mm -hmm. they, they take away all the jobs out of the parishes and it's, it's the kind of national concerns that are the ringleaders in that. They take away light housekeepers, they take away coast guards, they take mm -hmm. away policemen, they take away postmen. We used to have three men uh, employed locally as postmen in the parish. Mm -hmm. now, uh, Four uh, families of the, the lighthouse. The one lassie, local lassie who's got a, a job with the post office has to go to away to Stranra to operate it. Well, she now lives in Stranra. She's now married and lives in Stranra. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's no local post no. now. No, and then, no, of well, course, the farms, you see, in our day, there would be what? Three or four cot houses, That's all right. with families. Now it's mostly well, the farmer himself and mm. perhaps one man. So you lost all these families, right. and that's why the schools have gone down. Of course, yes. yes. Uh, the lighthouse used to be considered a good station mm. for the lighthouse keepers because it was a school station. That's right. And it was yes. people with young families. Well, when the lighthouse did go automatic, uh -huh. we lost eight children uh -huh. in one fell swoop. Yes, mm. yes, I remember when that big family mm -hmm. went away. There was a big family, and there was, there was one still not at school, but he was a prospective yes. Uh -huh. member. Yes, you could only look five years ahead in any school, you That's see. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's exactly it. And then, of course, it's, uh, it's a vicious circle. We got they've been taking away, taking away the kind of statutory jobs was the one big mistake. They, these are the bodies who should be committed to trying to reverse the trend. Mechanisation of the farms is almost inevitable, and therefore a reduction in farm workers is inevitable. But there's nothing inevitable about the post office's stand. Uh, about where the postman must live and uh, this is what the one thing that has bugged me for years I can remember a time when there was a vacancy for a postman in the parish and a young man, an ex-serviceman at that was told that he would have to go into Stranraer and do a walking duty for some time before he could hope to get a, a van duty mm. in Kirkmaiden and, and he lived in Kirkmaiden and he had married in Kirkmaiden. Ridiculous. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is not uh, just maybe the stand of the authority or mm. the post office, maybe fair as it ought to be said, this was the stand of the post office workers union. Mm -hmm. And uh, there again is... Uh, but even the postmaster now in Dromore does less handling of the mail oh, and, yes. and consequently so his income has been cut. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Uh, even even just sand sand head. Yes. You can't post a postcard with a sandhead postmark no. on it now. No, oh, no. Oh, no nothing. And this is, is the kind of blind folly of, uh, of government, uh, yes. these were government controlled uh, Central bodies. departments who don't know what it's like in the country. And the rural communities. They're, 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 making, they're making decisions on a basis of economy, economy, economy all the time. And uh, it means of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, such a short sighted policy. I don't know if it's pertinent to watch. <laughs> I would like to ask you, I know you had a reputation not only in your own parish but in the 
wider area for entertainment mm -hmm. and uh, to give us a lighter note mm -hmm. I would like you to tell me a bit about the people involved and what you did where you did it well, How you went about organising it? We, um, we had a quartet which started once as a really just as a, a sort of en special entertainment and it was quite successful and we started being invited out and I don't know when we actually started but I have a book here that I started writing programmes in in 1955 but we had been going for quite a while before that. It started with a GBA concert. Uh -huh. Well, we, 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 we had a... Why well, what actually we started the first quartet in fact was we, we were asked to go to the mall to do something. We were giving some sort of entertainment in the mall and we got a couple of people to join us whom we didn't have with us afterwards and then afterwards we got Andy and Andy McGuffey was our tenor, and Miss Agnes Grace McGaw, who's always called Miss McGaw, was our soprano, but she, she had a lovely voice, but she was a, a, quite a bit older than us. You can cut the this, but the first quartet was not Agnes Grace McGaw. No, that's what I've just first, said. No, I know that. The first quartet was Nanny. Yes, and the very first one was actually Grace McGuffey, the first time we had a quartet. For this first ad hoc, as I told you, for this special occasion, and it was Grace. But later on, we had Nanny, Nanny Morrison, who was with us for an, uh, quite a while until she either went to Glasgow to teach or, I think it's when she went up to Glasgow to teach, and then we had Agnes Grace McGall. And I, I mean, I remember that clearly. But the point was not so much, these were the people who were in it in the majority of the time. And we went all over the county, not just in the Rins, but across the Mackers as well, doing concerts for various bodies. I, I was, I think I already mentioned some of the places. Yes, could you, could you tell us from the book? Well, from I can tell you from the book, for instance, some of the places. Well, that was Lochans, Stony Kirk, the British Legion in Stranraer, Ardwell, the Glasgow Gallery Association, Larbrax, Gwen Luce. Um, Port William, Wigton. It was mostly Monreith, uh, Dock and Malg. We did a lot of WRI churches. community associations. And, and most the old of these folks, old folks, old parties, folks uh -huh. uh, where the, mm -hmm. the program was combined with mm -hmm. the entertainment meals or something like that. So it was, it was not entirely a a whole night concert. No. Wigton was the Boys Brigade, Lockins the Community Association, Port William was the Congregational Social, Glen Luce it was the Women's Guild, Kirkham an old folks thing, all sorts of, of various things. Um, we were at St Ninian's Priory in Wigton. When I haven't said it, that would be a, it'd be a church thing when I didn't say it, but it was something different. And I'm afraid our programme didn't vary a great deal. Eventually, Miss McGaw, who was older than us, really had to give up. And for a while we went on, just three of us, tenor, baritone, and a soprano piano. Sometimes Andy played his accordion, he was a little bit of variety. After a while, we really found that it was taking up too much time, you know, in the winter especially, and we had our parish duties and we kind of fell by the wayside. Oh, I'd never had done it, folks. And we did an awful lot of things. I mean, we were, after a while, we were back numbers, it must be confessed, because uh, there was other entertainers growing up as a hot TV. It was, they were finding other groups and so on, so we weren't in so much demand. And can you tell us from your book some of the items on your programme? Oh yes, yeah, because well, there are some of the items we are still doing to this day. Yeah. For instance, one of our great, uh, uh, we, we, had, we always had usually uh, a quartet selection from some film or show that was current. For instance, this one here is Hans Anderson, you know, the film. And uh, we, had, um, we had a group of sea shanties we did time and time again. We had the um, grandfather clock. Well, go the grandfather's clock. These are the ones we're still doing. Ellen Bannon. Yes, the thistle of Scotland. Um, the plans are gathering was always our opening yes. where we used to try and have verses. Uh -huh. uh, each one of us sang a verse, and I mm -hmm. had to sing a verse 
bringing in all the characters of the clans yes, in the in the parish. I wonder, the last time I sang it in Kermaden, I found that there were practically no clans left in Kermaden at all. <laughs> well, I see you. We the started. The were all disappeared. <laughs> we started with the Thistle of Scotland or come to the fair, but I see one time I've just written an opening chorus, so I expect that was the Thistle. But the clans come in here in 1958 at Port Logan. I wonder if that was the first time we did it. You haven't got any names of any of the people you would mention? No. Oh, How do you? In the, cl in the, in, clans. No. In the clans. No, but I'm uh, sure we've got I've, verses knocking I've about somewhere. Oh, yes, I could give you verses for uh, the old school. Uh, we were doing a special centenary of meal. You know what meal school yes, is? Yes, yes. Uh, and well, it's, its centenary was celebrated when we were on the go and Miss, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, McCracken was a head teacher. So we did a, a program in honour of me old mm -hmm. and we had a clans ver verse there. I've had a clans verse for High Kirk and Strandar. The last one I had uh, down, so in, down in Ramore not, not long ago when Andy joined us, we did what we were doing at that point. Well, I remember you brought in the McGilvery's into it, so it was just after he came. I was going to say, was it oh, his induction? Oh, I know what induction? it was. I know what it was. It was John's 80th birthday when we had oh, that wee celebration. The, uh -huh. the, um, com the welfare committee got uh -huh. together, oh, a little that. party, and we sang it then. And uh -huh. I think we've done another one since then, don't it, Kurt Maiden? Anyhow, um, uh, we... What was I going to say? We had all sorts of things. So yes, John and Andy, of course, had some very popular duets, which they're doing to this day. The Twins and the uh, Two Gay Owls and the uh, Andy and uh, both John and Andy and Sandy, which they've never got right yet. Yeah, Andy and um, we Pity are Andy isn't here. We could have had a yes. Yeah, so, uh -huh. <laughs> and we're. Uh, well, I was going to ask you about the Christian Aid because we're going to be doing the concert then. But that's, oh yeah. You know, yeah. Don't, don't have a little bit of publicity. Yeah. <laughs> And we had a lot of fun out of it, we really had. We, we made a lot of friends. I can always remember one occasion at Lundreath. Agnes Grace, who was unmarried, always used to say she was an unclaimed treasure. And this, and she and she well, would go to these concerts and say, I'm not getting anybody here. And of course she was the one who met, she knew so Everybody. many people. She, she was a wonderful person. All over the she knew people all over, and she had a great memory. And then this night at Munreath, she stood up and said something about being an unclaimed treasure on the platform. And, and somebody, a voice from the back, says, I'll tack you, Agnes Grace. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, right, but I don't think it but went any further. wouldn't have done, no. But that was the kind of thing that happened at yes. these concerts. Uh -huh. yeah. It was good fun. We had a lot of fun. But that is the way you get to know people mm. and, and make good friends, isn't mm. it? And, and moving around.